This segment of WGCU's Local Untold Stories is underwritten by Charlotte County Government County Commission, Charlotte County Public Schools, City of Punta Gorda City Council, Charlotte County Airport Authority, Burson Weathers Real Estate. Chronicles of Florida's common have been largely overlooked in American history, while iconic images of the Western cowboy became legends etched into our shared narrative, depicted as dashing, daring heroes of the frontier. Florida had very different but equally fascinating characters who tended cows. They were a unique breed that braved scorching prairies, traversed alligator and snake-infested swamps, hunted wild cows in woods teeming with predators, and who thrived against incredible odds. This is the story of Florida's cattle industry and the character and culture of the people who made it possible. From the first cowboys to cracker cowmen to modern day ranchers. Come on, come on. We'll look at the land they worked, the cattle they raised, and the problems they faced. A great many people think that the cattle industry in the United States started in Texas or Oklahoma or somewhere out west, when in reality the first cattle and hogs and horses that came to Florida were brought right here. The first livestock came into Florida in the year 1521, and Ponce de Leon brought them here on his last voyage. Florida's cattle industry actually began long before any settlers ventured down into the peninsula. North America's first cowboys were, in fact, Spaniards and Native Americans. Florida had a lot of mystique about it in the sense that it was part of this massive continental landscape that the Spaniards at that time didn't know much about. So they really didn't know if there were vast uh, sources of wealth, gold and silver and pearls and other things, as was the case in other parts of the New World. While Florida was a mystery to Europeans, the peninsula was home to numerous Native American tribes who weren't always keen on welcoming newcomers. In 1513, Juan Ponce de Leon became convinced he might discover riches, status, and perhaps even the legendary Fountain of Youth somewhere beyond the beach. He didn't actually make landfall until his second trip in 1521. When he came back, he brought uh, two ships and people and supplies and presumably livestock as well and they began to offload in southwest Florida, somewhere in the vicinity of the mouth of the Caloosahatchee River near Fort Myers. And they were almost immediately descended upon by Calusa warriors who attacked the force and ended up giving Ponce de Leon uh, a mortal wound from which he later died in Havana, Cuba. Many of his livestock were slaughtered, but some managed to escape into Florida's dense woods. These beasts, which were large, long-horned, and darkly pigmented, reportedly became part of the base stock for the state's future cattle industry. Despite de Leon's failed attempt, the Spanish remained undeterred. In 1565, Pedro Menendez de Aviles finally established Spain's first successful colony, North America's oldest city, St. Augustine. The whole Spanish colonial strategy, really across the New World, but particularly focusing in Florida, was to establish cities of Spanish colonists. And the way that worked is by sending missionaries to first convert them from a religious point of view. The Spanish missions on the surface were all about religious conversion to the Catholic faith. Missions were the means by which Spaniards penetrated, gradually absorbed, and assimilated many of Florida's Native American societies. While few records exist, it appears some natives and Spaniards established working relationships and struck deals which allowed the Spanish to raise cattle and turn some profit. In return, they shared some profits and cattle raising know-how with the Indian chiefs. 
They did pick up a lot of the things that the Spanish knew. I'm sure over the years, there was times they were doing a lot of the trading. Of course, back at that time, like I said, you know, we weren't known as the Seminoles. You had different uh, tribes, you know, Alachua, Tamucas, you know, Calusas. There was different tribes up and down through the state of Florida. Tribes began raising their own cattle and soon became successful entrepreneurs within the industry. During the 1600s, there were around 34 ranches in Florida under Spanish control. But the French and English, who were also eager to exploit the wealth of the Americas, increasingly came into conflict with Spain's expanding Floridian Empire. The end of the ranching period in the, in the primary Spanish mission period occurred primarily due to the pressure of English allied Indians, Creeks and Yamases out of South Carolina and Georgia, who came down to Spanish Florida in search of Indian slaves. From the 1650s to 1706, invasions led by English allies virtually destroyed the cattle trade industry in Florida. By 1706, the entire interior of Spanish Florida had been abandoned, and all the cattle ranches were no longer safe to be on. But gradually, those very same Indians began to move into the area, first as deerskin producers. They'd hunt in the area, and gradually they became cattle ranchers. The Spanish referred to the Creeks out of Georgia as Cimarrones, which eventually morphed into the name Seminoles. So the Seminoles of North Central Florida became ranchers using, presumably, at least in part, some of the cattle that had been left behind by the Spanish ranchers. During this period, it was common for cattle and buffalo herds to mix on Florida's vast prairies. From 1763 to 1783, Britain officially maintained control of Florida. The English introduced cattle descended from their shorthorn and longhorn breeds. The longhorns were well suited to Florida's climate. This stock mixed with the surviving Spanish stock and the combination evolved into the Florida Piney Woods or Scrub Bull. This small bull was tough, quick, and sported sharp horns which helped protect it from predators and often from one another. Piney Woods bulls were highly territorial and prone to fighting challengers. Territorial conflict was a common theme during this period. From 1775 to 1783, citizens of the New World and their former countrymen battled one another in the American Revolutionary War. During and after the war, settlers were trickling down into the peninsula. They came in here with wagons and carts that were drawn by oxen. And to make these oxen pull a load, they had a whip and they cracked the whip. And through the cracking of this whip, and this is a cow whip that I hold here in my hand, that's how we get our nickname, the Florida Crackers. Some historians believe the origins of the term cracker go back even further. The best evidence clearly indicates that the term cracker originated in Scotland in the 1700s. It appears in a dictionary in Scotland in the mid-1700s, and it was not a term of endearment, but it applied to the men who were herders of sheep. When these Europeans migrated to America, the term reportedly came with them. Essentially, it's to indicate a person who was born in Georgia or Florida. So the, the issue of birth determined whether or not you were a cracker. Because anyone who's embarrassed to be called one certainly isn't one. During the latter part of the 18th century, most settlers didn't venture further south than Kissimmee. They survived through hunting, the small-scale raising of cattle, and sustenance farming. Hold up there, hombre. Life for early settlers was complicated by numerous factors. The relentless summer heat, harsh weather, predators, mosquitoes, poor soil quality, and outlaws. Groups of cattle and horse thieves traveled the state terrorizing individuals and even whole communities. As early settlers were moving into northern Florida, the first Seminole War was forcing Native Americans further inland. The first campaign lasted from 1817 to 1818. In 1821, Florida became an official U.S. possession. At the time, there were at least 5,000 Seminole, Creek, and Miccosukee residents. Florida's Indians allowed their cattle free reign on the open prairie and didn't generally mark them to prove ownership. This was not the case with Florida's new settlers. These cowmen borrowed a very old method of marking cattle called branding. It's a hot iron brand. That's, that's the most permanent identification, the easiest and cheapest and, and the, the best identification that you can have. But branding cattle wasn't a simple task. You had to be man enough to pick up his leg and want to throw him. 
and sometimes another one to flank him and hold him until you've done the ear marking. And you have two, three cattle catchers. You pick him up with the right hind leg, right foreleg, and then the one to flank him and hold him until you got done what you're going to do. The first cattle brands in Florida were in the territorial period in the late 1820s. By 1831, the Florida Legislative Council passed a bill that became a law that provided that if you branded the cow that belonged to another, that would be considered a theft and be subject to prosecution for having stole the cow. There were also problems related to the branding of cows found without a brand that actually belonged to someone else. There was a lot of cattle rustling itself. Cattle rustling was simply the stealing of someone else's cattle, and it was considered a major crime. Cattle owners went to great lengths to protect their investment. They had brands on the cattle, and they earmarked them. They cut different shaped notches in the ear. When you rode up on a wild cow, they naturally look at you and you knew immediately who it belonged to by the ear notches. Life was hard for Florida's Indians in the 1820s and 30s. Many were being forced to move away to Indian Territory near present-day Oklahoma. Those who refused to leave were forced onto reservations. This drastically changed the Seminole lifestyle. There wasn't no just being nomadic like there was at one time, you know, roaming the state of Florida. So they began to have large herds of cattle. Land and cattle rights became a major source of contention between the Seminole and white settlers. That's what some of the skirmishes were sometimes about, is ownership and who could raise their cattle here and raise their cattle there. So only thing with us, we didn't have nobody to go tell, you know, that, hey, they're over there stealing our cattle. But they went to the United States and they had, the, you know, the, the uh, army and things behind them. The Seminole Wars were an accumulation of the problems that existed between the, the Seminoles and the white settlers. The Indians, of course, felt like that the land didn't belong to anybody, that it was for anyone to use, and that was uh, the way they had lived for generations, and that's the way they, they intended to continue to live. From the whites' perspective, the land was open to settle, but because it hadn't been surveyed, it couldn't actually be purchased. So they settled where they wished and claimed areas as their own. There was automatic conflict between the two conflicting cultures and that did result frequently in violence. There wasn't a whole lot of elders, you know, that really wanted to continue this war. They had a little wisdom and said, hey, you know, maybe it'd be better to go and get our tools and our mules and that they're going to give us to go to Oklahoma. But many young warriors, such as Osceola, were determined to stay. The Second Seminole War was between 1836 and 1842, and certainly cattle played a role in that. There was a major freeze in Florida in 1835, and where the Seminoles were forced to move after the first Seminole War was over was land that was not as productive as it had been earlier, but the freeze destroyed just about all of the crops that they had. The freeze left Indians desperate and nearly destitute, and the world around them was rapidly changing. On March 3rd, 1845, Florida became the 27th state in the Union. There was a population of 70,000. Between 1840 and 1850, Florida's cattle numbers grew from over 118,000 to over 261,000. By the end of the Third Seminole War in 1858, nearly all Native Americans were forced to move from Florida to the Western Territories of Arkansas and Oklahoma. Possibly as few as 300 Seminole remained, and they had taken refuge in the inhospitable swamps of the Everglades. When they started pushing us and we had to begin on getting on the run, there was no time to even raise cattle. They killed the cattle. They killed the cattle or they took the cattle and, you know, and put it into their own herds. There was nobody raising cattle in at that time. That's why when we had to depend on the government, they got us some scrub cattle. That's how we started off, you know, when we got becoming federally recognized. The Seminole eventually established themselves as some of the largest cattle producers in the state. By 1860, the number of cattle in Florida had risen to nearly 390,000. In Florida, we have every natural advantage to grow cows and calves. That is, we have a mild climate, we have uh, plenty of, uh, of uh, level land, and uh, adequate rainfall. This land was a natural grassland. We can graze cows here the year round. We don't have to buy grain, we don't have to buy uh, protein, we don't put up hay. 
In the industry's early days, there were no fences. Cattle grazed open prairies, and their owners did their best to keep after them. Nobody owned the land, and it was just there, and so they grazed it. But you had different owners cattle grazing in the same areas, so during the roundup time, each ranch would send his representative there, and they'd gather the cattle, and they'd do what we call mamming the calves up. Mammying up was necessary while branding was taking place so animals were credited to their rightful owners. Mamming up calves required a keen eye for detail. Common learned to watch which calves followed which cow. They observed the animal's colors, patterns, the curl of the leg hair, and even the set in the shoulders in order to distinguish ownership. And they were very good at it. And so when it came time to mark and brand the calves, oh yeah, that belongs to Joe Blow, or whoever it did, and very few errors. When they got done, every rancher would go his separate way. In order to be a successful common in Florida, one had to have the proper tools. And the most important was a good horse. That's your vehicle right there. You gotta be able to take him where you want him to go. In the early days of cattle ranching, the cracker horse, or marsh tacky, was the preferred horse of most cowmen. Another necessity for a successful cattle operation was cattle dogs. These were dogs of various breeds that helped with herding. Whatever they do is born in them. You take your horse and guide him where you want him to go, but the dog keep in the bunch. The dog's job was to bark and nip at cow's heels to keep them together. A catch dog actually held the cow by the nose, ear, or leg until its owner caught up to handle the situation. A good horse, some dogs, skill with a whip, and oftentimes a gun for protection was what the early Florida cowman required to get the job done. Cowmen were often forced to scour the woods rounding up wild cattle. This was referred to as cow hunting. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Oh, the streams are swollen. Keep them One of their primary tasks was leading or driving cattle from place to place. Drives could be fast and furious or slow and tedious. Drovers just had to go with the flow. And they didn't want to move them too fast because these cattle were all grass fed. And if they moved them too fast and they didn't allow them enough time to eat along the way, then they'd shrink. They wouldn't have near as heavy a bodies and they wouldn't be worth the money. The purpose of drives was often to get herds to the point of sale or shipment, or to where they could be medically treated, or simply to move them onto greener pastures. The drives were as unpredictable as the cattle. Some of the livestock collected by settlers were descendants of the Spanish breed that had been roaming wild through Florida's woods for generations. Sometimes it could be very dangerous because a lot of these old Florida cows, would just they'd wait for you to get close to them and they'd charge you just like the wildest animal in Africa. Oftentimes, getting the beasts out from the woods and onto the prairie took longer than the entire drive, and drives could last for weeks. Life was hard on the families cowmen left behind. Lonesome. And see, I had a brother with a hemophilic, like, and that, that tied my mother down. But she raised us one of the four of us, but she raised the four and took care of that sick boy and his daddy was gone. It'd be about two weeks at the time. It was up to the women and children to tend to the home front while the men were away. We did the job homes, keeping the growing garden. Of course, helped take care of the animals, the horses, and everything was done by hand. Sometimes they also helped tend to the cow camps, areas established along regularly traveled routes where drovers would stop, rest, and have a meal. Dried beef, salt, paper, bacon, biscuits, and rice. It's a lot of times beans. While the accommodations weren't all that impressive, drovers commonly slept on the ground on their mosquito tents, the men were often met with some of the comforts of home. When we'd go to cow camp, I'd climb up on the fence, waiting for them to come. And uh, I could hear that whip parking way off in the woods, and then I knew they were coming in the camp. Cracking whips could be heard for miles. Whips were used not only to move cattle, but also as a form of communication. Cracker Common often employed a Morse code type pattern to get messages to one another across long distances. One man, often referred to as the king of the Cracker Cowmen, owned herds ranging from Bartow to the Caloosahatchee River. The king of the Crackers uh, was a man the make of, name of Jacob Southern, and they called him J Big Jake. He was a man that was unpretentious. He didn't care anything about fancy clothes and fancy houses and all those kind of things. 
While Summerlin found little value in outward displays of wealth, he was a true cattle baron and one of Florida's richest men. Through the years, he remained an avid philanthropist. Jacob Summerlin often worked with James McKay. Both were heavily involved in the shipping of cattle. They'd even managed to establish trade relations with Cuba. Herds were driven from all over the state to a number of shipping points. Punta Rasa, south of Fort Myers, at the mouth of the Caloosahatchee River, was a primary cattle port. From Punta Rasa, they were loaded onto ships bound for Cuba. Just prior to the Civil War in 1858, 1859, is when the cattle shipping industry uh, in Florida took in the, the area of Cuba for a market. This connection became difficult to maintain at the onset of the Civil War. In January 1861, Florida signed a formal ordinance of secession, withdrew from the Union, and soon joined other southern states to form the Confederate States of America. When the American Civil War started, uh, an embryonic but very successful cattle industry had been flourishing in Florida for just a few years, and that was totally interrupted by the events of the Civil War. There were a few instances of blockade running, but that was pretty much stopped because you had, in the case of Charlotte Harbor, a Union Navy blockade. In 1863, Union companies were positioned in Fort Myers. These troops were intent on raiding Confederate cattle herds and preventing cattle operations. In response, the Confederates organized into a force that became known as the Cow Cavalry. When the Confederacy was cut off from all of their supply of meat from out west, Florida became the major supplier. The Florida Cow Cavalry provided over 300,000 head of cows to Confederate troops up north. The first recorded combat of the South Florida Cattle Wars occurred in January 1864 at Fort Thompson, an old Seminole War outpost on the Caloosahatchee River. The Cow Cavalry disbanded shortly after the Battle of Fort Myers in 1865, which marked the end of the Civil War in South Florida. Florida's cattlemen were eager to get back to business. After the Civil War was over, uh, certainly Jake Summerlin played a very significant role in the in re-establishing the cattle industry as it relates to selling cattle to Cuba. He was also behind the effort to re-establish the shipping facilities at Punta Rasa. He's the man who built the facilities there and controlled the actual cattle loading dock. At that very same time was when the interocean cable was established between Punta Rasa and Havana. So you had telegraphic service between Punta Rasa and Cuba. This communication link kept Floridians informed on the latest cattle market prices in Cuba and on weather conditions between the two points. George Schultz, the first telegraph operator, established what eventually became a hotel in Punta Rasa. My daddy said he was a young man that drove cattle to Punta Rasa to go to Cuba, up to Cuba. My uncle started with, um, with about 125 cows coming out of what we call the Devil's Garden area going to Punta Rasa, which was about 60, 70 miles trip, which it took several days to get that far. Well, anyway, when he got to Punta Rasa, he had about 800 cows. We don't know whose cows they were, but he had a pretty good cash in over there. They had vast cattle pens, and they would pen the cattle here until the ships were ready to take them to their destination. They were paid in Spanish gold, gold doubloons. For many years, the state's cattle industry was fairly dependent on trade with Cuba. But it wasn't Florida's only cattle export destination. They were also shipped from various seaports to the Bahamas, Key West, and even New York. There were a number of uh, points in southwest Florida where cattle were shipped, starting with Tampa, the Manatee River, the Mayaca River, the Peace River, Fort Winder, which is a little ways up the Peace River, was one of the cattle loading facilities, Hickory Bluff, which is now called Charlotte Harbor. In the late 1800s, Florida was considered the last frontier in the U.S., the end of the known world, and it was brave souls who ventured into this foreign landscape. My grandfather uh, came from Cloverport, Kentucky, uh, with two mules in a wagon and wound up in Charlotte Harbor. He was a sawmill man, and he brought the first sawmill into this area, which is now Charlotte County in 1882. My father said that, uh, that he said it took them 54 days of travel. Like many newcomers, the Huckabees eventually got into the cattle business. Many new settlers were lured to Florida in the 1880s by the introduction of railroads. 
The first railroad that was then built was by Henry Bradley Plant to Tampa in 1883. That was followed in 1886 by the Florida Southern Railway's construction of a railroad to Punta Gorda. Southwest Florida was no longer a remote destination. My grandfather, or great-grandfather, started cutting cross ties for um, Henry Flagler building a railroad from Jacksonville to, uh, to Key West. And they'd go ahead cutting pine timber down for the cross ties for the railroad. Most cattlemen weren't in favor of the new railroads. They provided them no economic benefit and they were economic hazard. That hazard came in the form of cattle being struck by trains. Cows would often lie on the new tracks cutting through the prairie. And the train came through Moffett or Lower Wachula and killed 48 cows one night. It ran through a herd of cows and killed 48 cows. The railroads generally compensated cattlemen for their losses, but in this instance they failed to pay on time. So the cowboys got out to get even and they greased the track at the water tower where the train could not move and when it stopped to take on water then they set out in the bushes and shot the boiler of the train, just shot at it. They didn't shoot anybody, they just shot the train up. There are instances where there are huge piles of logs placed on the railroad track and set on fire just before a train was to arrive and other similar acts of hostility toward the railroads. Cattlemen also realized railroads meant more homesteaders would be coming to settle on ranch land, land they weren't necessarily interested in sharing. It wasn't long, though, before cattle owners were also reaping the benefits of the railways. Shipping cattle by rail eventually became the preferred method. We shipped them out by the carload. They got into raising steers. Part of them were for the, went to Madison Square Gardens for the rodeos and they'd ship them right, right out of Immokalee. With the introduction of railroad travel and the end of the Civil War, Florida's population boomed. A number of Southwest Florida's frontier cow towns were formally established at the end of the 19th century. Fort Myers in 1876, Punta Gorda and Arcadia in 1886, and LaBelle in 1895. After long cattle drives, cowmen entered these towns eager to spend their wages and blow off steam. Historians report there was an air of lawlessness in many of these communities. In the case of Punta Gorda, where you had these cattle drives that came here, you'd have a, a herd of cattle of eight or 900 cows being driven down the main street of Punta Gorda, and the cattlemen there who had been on the prairie for five, six, seven weeks coming into town and celebrating. And they, of course, would not be uh, tame, and they were looking for uh, trouble, and they were looking for entertainment. Punta Rasa and these other Florida cow towns were wilder than Dodge City or Abilene or any of those places ever thought about then. There were desperados here, there were gunfights, there were lynchings, and it was frontier justice at its wildest. And it wasn't just drovers fueling the wild atmosphere. Sometimes it was the locals, the cattlemen, and even the politicians. Every man made his own law. So there was war between the cattlemen and their horsemen that worked for them, and it ended sometimes in multiple deaths. Despite the dangerous frontier atmosphere, it was during this time one of America's most illustrious inventors came to live in Southwest Florida. In 1885, Thomas Edison and his partner, Ezra Gilliland, came to Florida. They were looking for land where they could raise uh, tropical plants that they might use in some of their uh, various experiments. Edison discovered the ideal location in Fort Myers, a location situated along one of Lee County's most well-worn cattle trails. There was a building on it. It was an early cracker house that's right in back of me here. Uh, it was used by the cattlemen who were running the cows right down through the middle of his property to Punta Rasa. And so the property contained uh, two halves of a riverside estate divided by a cattle road with a cattleman's house on it. Edison promptly purchased the property for $2,350. The road, which eventually became McGregor Boulevard, was used during the early days of Edison's ownership of the property still as a cattle road. Like cowboys out west, cracker cowboys had a certain style, a way of dress that suited their lifestyle and personality. Their style was tailored to life in the woods or on the prairie, where they faced intense heat and torrential rain. Crackers slept on the ground and fought off thick swarms of mosquitoes and local predators. They were ever mindful of snakes, alligators, panthers, wolves, and bears. 
you need to have boots that have a heel on them you know, for riding horses. Uh, if not, you know, your foot will slide through the stirrups. And you gotta have jeans to ride a horse. Most also wore large brimmed felt hats. They looked a lot like I do today. They wore gingham shirts, suspenders. Most of them were a whole lot thinner than I am. They were kind of gaunt, and they were kind of a bedraggled looking bunch of guys for the most part. It was this bedraggled bunch Frederick Remington discovered during his tour through Florida in 1895. Frederick Remington is generally noted as the great Western artist, and he glamorized the cowboys in the West. He loved them, they had a lot of dash and sparkle. Conversely, with the Florida cowmen, he said that they were not very attractive, that they were lazy and slovenly and not inclined to work, and that they were not skilled, they didn't ride a horse well, they didn't shoot well. But one can discover Remington's true opinion of Florida's common through his private correspondence to his friend, famed author, Owen Wister. He indicated to Owen Wister that he needed to come down and see these Florida cowmen. He just wouldn't believe them. Uh, they're so interesting. While in Florida, Remington painted a number of landscapes, one of which included a relatively unflattering depiction of Morgan Bonaparte Mazel, one of the state's most notorious cracker cowboys. Bone Mazel was as close to the ultimate cowboy as anybody could possibly be, but not a cowboy, a cow hunter. And he was a unique individual. He never owned a piece of property. He was never married. Mazel spent his entire life working cattle between Orange and DeSoto counties. He was range foreman for both the Parkers and the Kings and was known for his sense of humor and run-ins with the law. He was a heavy drinker. He was a prankster. He had a lisp to him that made it look like he was somewhat tongue-tied, but he was a real cattle man. One story often recounted is from a time when Mazel worked for Ziba King. A wild calf had charged off into a thicket, and King told him if he could get it out, the animal was his. He went right on in, the horse threw him, and the only thing he had on him to mark that calf was a knife he had on him. And he tried to mark it with his knife, but he could mark, get close enough to his ear to mark it. But he did get close enough to him to bite the ear, and they claim that calf grew up to be a, a lopsided calf with that big piece of his ear cut off. Mazel ended up drinking himself to death by the age of 58. As the 19th century drew to a close, the number of large ranching operations increased. Dad's cattle ranged from the Clusatchee River to Arcadia. And uh, so, you know, he needed a big crew to work it, and everybody else did too. So he was just a one hand in the crew while they worked everybody's cattle. He has got worked also. Ranchers commonly worked together both to simplify their efforts and protect their interests. It was during this time Bob Roberts was lured from Hardy County to Immokalee in Collier County by the vast frontier he discovered there. He was already in the cattle business, and he thought this would be the place to increase his herd, so he made a train for a place. Some cattlemen were achieving a high level of power and prestige in the industry. Mr. Luther Kuhn here in Ponte Gorda was a big cattleman. Likes Brothers later on became, uh, at that time they were a large cattle producer and, and had a large herd of cattle. The Jesse Knight family who lived at Hickory Bluff, now called Charlotte Harbor, they were major cattle producers of in the Charlotte Harbor, Peace River, Maca River area. Ziba King, whose headquarters was at Fort Ogden. War veteran and politician Captain Francis A. Hendry was another powerful cattleman in southwest Florida. Hendry County was actually named for him. Called the Cattle King of South Florida. He was uh, very interested in uh, not only the social life and the politics, and, and he donated uh, property for, I think it was a Methodist church, and, and did a lots of uh, civic and social things for the people here. Hendry, like many of the influential cattlemen, served in the Florida legislature. Ziba King was a member of the state senate. These people were leaders in the political welfare of the area. They were very active in the uh, economic welfare of the area. They were the real leaders and movers and shakers of southwest Florida. These leaders helped ease Florida through the gradual transition from wild frontier life to more civil societies. In the 1900s, things were settled by the cattlemen getting together as a group and being warned that they were destroying themselves as well as 
destroying many times their own cattle. While life on the home front was settling down, trouble was brewing abroad. Many of Florida's men were shipped overseas to fight during World War I, which lasted from 1914 to 1918. It was during the First World War that Florida's road system received a tremendous boost. In 1915, you had the organization for the first time of a state highway department in Florida, which started building roads that interconnected so that people driving automobiles had access to almost the entire state. The additional roads made shipping cattle by truck far quicker and more economical than by train. More roads meant more people. In the 1920s, a development boom extended into South Florida. During this time, the timber industry was also buying up large portions of area land. Their purchases ended up benefiting cattle producers. The timber industry really didn't want the land, but they had to buy it to get the timber. So the cattleman that was leasing the land got the land at a good price. They paid about a dollar to a dollar and a half an acre for it. And uh, that's how a lot of the cattlemen got, you know, got their land. While cattlemen had acquired a great deal of land, it wasn't long before Florida's economic bubble burst. Severe hurricanes in 1926 and 1928 took many lives and damaged the state's economy. Some shops began dealing in a type of bartering trade. They would actually fatten up a beef, slaughter it, and take it to a grocery store, and the grocery store would give you credit toward future purchases. He didn't give you any money. He gave you credit toward your purchases of other items that you needed. The stock market collapse of 1929 and the onset of the Great Depression led to desperate times across the entire country. But in Florida, people weren't generally starving, largely thanks to the cattle, agriculture, and fishing industries. We also had canning plants here to can the vegetables and can the meat. There was a lot of food that we raised here for the needy families. And most of the people were needy back then. Really, it was real poverty. I grew up in it, I remember it. The Depression had a devastating impact on Florida's cattle industry, and it came in the form of screw worms. Herds imported from the country's Dust Bowl area were infested with the worms, which spread like wildfire across the state. The government bought up a bunch of purebred Hereford cattle out there and shipped them down here for the Indians to use. After we dehorned those cows, they got maggots in their horns, and we didn't know what it was. So we got the dip inspector to look at them, and he says, I think that's what they call screw worms, says they have them out west. While screw worms were small, they were a deadly predator. Hatched screw worms could eat a full-grown cow alive in less than three days, newborns in less than 24 hours. The screw worms were getting the little baby calves as navel or any place, and we'd have to catch these calves and dig them with worms out and put that smear X in those navels and hope the Lord it kill the worms. The need to catch cattle to treat them forced cowhands to learn the skill of roping. An effective cure for screw worms was eventually discovered, and that cure came as quite a surprise. The state did the darnest thing in the world. One of the professors at Gainesville came up with, well, let's sterilize all, a, a whirl of screw worm flies. Let's fly them all over Florida and dump them out, or South Florida and dump them out. And eventually, we'll probably, there won't be any more breeding because all the male flies will be sterile. And sure enough, that got rid of the screw worms. An equally destructive invader called the Texas fever tick also cost Florida's cattle industry millions of dollars in the 20s and 30s. The tick actually began migrating south from the northern part of the state in the early 1900s. The only way to get rid of this insect was to repeatedly dip cattle in a chemical solution. What the state did, they went all over the state of Florida building dipping vats. And they would put strychnine and water in this stuff, a long vat about 100 feet long. And they it had a concrete bottom, and they'd fill it full of water, and they'd make the cattle jump off in the dipping vats, and there was enough poison in there that it would kill the ticks. The state saw to it cattle ranchers were dipping every two weeks. Even the wild woods cattle had to be dipped to prevent further infestation. There were large numbers of them still roaming the big cypress swamp that had to be hunted out. The state hired what they called range riders. My father was one of them, and they tried to gather them and finally got permission just to kill them. So they killed all the wild cattle out of the Big Cypress Swamp over the next two or three years. And at that same time, they found the deer were toting the fever tick. Nearly 9,000 deer were also killed. 
and the state was eventually forced to import deer and bulls to replenish their numbers. It took many years to completely eradicate the Texas fever tick in Florida. In 1929, an event established in DeSoto County provided Southwest Floridians some much needed relief, a diversion closely connected to the cattle industry. It was homegrown entertainment. I'm sure they had boys get together and ride some horses or bulldog some steers before that, but the first official rodeo was in 1929. Rodeo is the only sport that came from what cowboys do every day on the ranches they work for. Arcadia's All Florida Championship Rodeo was an instant success. In their rodeo's early days, local ranchers donated bulls that were ridden and most competitors used their own horses. Nearly all of them were working cowboys, like five-time rodeo champion Jack Duncan. While women's roles in the rodeo were limited, they continually proved themselves worthy competitors. Women in rodeo was always um, limited to the barrel racing and, and some of that, but they were just as good a cowboy. They could really ride. Zona McCorkdale was an all-Florida cowgirl in the 40s. I just looked pretty and rode a horse good. I just rode out there and they said, run out there, and so I ran out to the middle of the arena, and they wanted me to get off, so I got off the horse, got back on, and went running back. In the rodeo's early days, competitors generally learned roping and riding skills on the ranch or prairie through trial and error. Training for today's riders is a whole other animal. You don't learn how to ride bulls on a ranch. On a ranch, you feed livestock, and you build fence, and you cut hay and stack hay, and, and riding bulls, you go to a rodeo riding school to learn how to do that. I grew up in the rodeo environment. I had a great opportunity to be a champion, and uh, I won eight world titles in the bull riding event. I hold all of the records, and uh, so I, rodeo's my life. Nowadays, champions from all over the world participate in Arcadia's All Florida Championship Rodeo, and it continues to provide DeSoto County revenue and recognition. Numerous organizations, including hospitals and youth organizations, have received hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations from the rodeo. And then it's in addition to producing a good family entertainment. Arcadia's rodeo has run continuously since 1929. While the 20s and 30s were difficult years, during this time, two of the state's larger cattle producing companies managed to become formally established. Marlon W. Hilliard had spent years in the woods of Southwest Florida hunting while tending to his herds of cattle. In 1932, Marlon convinced his brother, Joe A. Hilliard, to join his cattle operation. The two formed Hilliard Brothers of Florida in Henry County. In about 1930, late 1932, Uncle Marlin had accumulated a large bunch of cattle, and they took those cattle to Punta Rassa and put them on barges and sold them to Likes Brothers, and that's when they first had some money. With their profits, the Hilliards improved their herds and purchased large amounts of land. Florida back in them days wanted to get rid of land anyway. They didn't want it either. They wanted to try to get development in here. Joe Hilliard's son, Joe Marlin Hilliard, eventually joined the family business. Today, he and his children run Hilliard Brothers. Joe Marlin maintains a long record of public service, and he eventually became the president of the Florida Cattlemen's Association, which had formed in 1934. My father was very involved in it. I was very involved in it. In fact, I became the president of it in 1985, and my son became the president of it in 1996. Alto Bud Adams Jr. of Adams Ranch in St. Lucie County was also an FCA president. The Florida Cattlemen's Association has always been very uh, uh, good spokesman for our industry and able to get things done that we couldn't do as individuals. It was Alto Adams Sr. who established Adams Ranch in Fort Pierce in 1937. It was coming out of the depression and the land was cheap and uh, all this land was open range and unfenced. And he bought Mr. Uh, Wright Carlton's herd of cattle, the brand and the cattle, the whole works. The Fort Pierce headquarters is around 55,000 acres total. The largest Adams operation is in Osceola County. We're pretty low tech. We own almost no machinery. All of our cows are born naturally 
unassisted. They give birth now as naturally as the deer or the bison or the wild animals do. That's natural selection. Bud Adams is credited with developing a whole new breed of cow called the Brayford. We had some wild Brahma type range cattle. We felt that we needed a, a better quality animal. At that time, the Hereford was a premier beef breed in the world, so we crossed Herefords with the Brahma, which greatly improved the carcass traits and also added uh, fertility and uh, quiet disposition. Adams Ranch is considered a cow-calf operation. We raise steers for the feedlot. They're finished. They, they provide your a beef you buy in a supermarket. Many of Florida's cattle ranches are considered cow-calf operations. Cattle are born and raised in-state and then sold to feedlots elsewhere. Over the years, increasing the size and improving the breeds of Florida's cattle became crucial to keeping up within the competitive industry. Originally in Florida, we had scrub cattle. They were scrawny, they were tough, but they could, they could uh, make a living without any improved pasture, no fertilizer and all that. Crossbreeding scrub cattle became important to industry advancement. They found they could crossbreed them, breed the, the Brahma to the Hereford or the Brahma to the Angus or the Brahma to the Charlet, and in so doing, they would pick up the hybrid vigor, which makes the animal just do better, but the animal that came out of that cross would have a thinner skin and less hair, would be able to get along better in this heat than the parents. In 1949, Florida, the nation's final frontier, became one of the last states to adopt a fence law for cattle. Endless Prairie suddenly became sectioned off property. And the reason why that they passed the fence law is more and more and more highways were being built across Florida. People began to have these head-on collisions with a cow out there. Of course, the cow usually got killed, but sometimes somebody got killed. On cool evenings, cattle would often lie on the roads to absorb heat from the pavement. While it was obvious cows and cars couldn't share the roadways, having to purchase the materials and expend the labor to build fences across acres of prairie suddenly made the business of ranching much more costly. Some smaller operations didn't survive, while others continued to prosper. It was in 1950 that the Roberts family of Immokalee officially incorporated as the Red Cattle Company. Well, that was my daddy's name for your operation. Red Cattle Company, because he started off with red cattle. First bull we got was Hereford. The Red Cattle Company grew to be a major competitor in Florida's cattle industry. At one time, he was one of the larger in Florida. Now, I could say the largest, maybe number 10. During the 1950s, land values in Florida were escalating. The increase forced out even more of the small-scale ranches. If you look at the land cost, there is no way that if you really just wanted to be in the cattle business and you used the profits from cattle to buy the land, you couldn't do it. The Greenbelt Law, enacted in 1959, was created to salvage Florida's agricultural industry. We were able to get a Greenbelt Law passed. That provided that if land was in agriculture, it should be assessed on its agricultural value instead of maybe an acre that would sold for a service station or something like that. If we didn't have the Greenbelt Law, we wouldn't have a cattle industry. In fact, if you didn't have a Greenbelt Law, there would be very few agricultural industries that would exist in Florida today. Sustaining a career in agriculture has never been easy in Florida. There have been a lot of obstacles, but crackers are a hardy bunch. Since the state's first settlers, people learned to make the best use of their land. Cattlemen weren't generally dependent only on cattle. They also raised crops hunted, ran sawmills, or engaged in other types of ventures. The Hilliard brothers eventually expanded into the sugarcane industry. In 1961, Cuba broke off all relationship with the United States, or the United States broke off all ties with Cuba, and we went in the sugar business then. In other words, the, 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 Cuba was supplying the United States with most of their sugar. The Hilliards now grow over 12,000 acres of sugarcane. And then in 1985, we went in the orange grove business after all the big freezes in North Florida killed all the oranges. While Florida is famous for its oranges, beaches, and tourist industry, it was cattle that originally kick-started Florida's economy. Many counties produced cattle over the years, and many still do. 
It's moved a little bit around. Believe it or not, Palm Beach County at one time was the largest cattle county in the state. When I moved to Henry County in 1979, Henry County was the largest cattle county in the state. DeSoto County has been one of the largest cattle producers in the United States. Uh, time perhaps with Texas and um, New Mexico. Seminole ranchers have also continued to be highly successful in the industry over the years. We're probably around the fourth largest cattle operation, third or fourth cattle operation in Florida. There are many issues facing Florida's cattle ranchers in the 21st century. Statewide, I'd say water would be probably the absolute number one issue, and rural urban interface would be another one, and it and water kind of go together. We've only got a certain amount of water for, for the whole state, and the more people we get, the, the more it's split up. Environmental regulations, you know, surely can deter people from being in, in agriculture, and that's why some ranchers have sold out. The Florida legislature hopes a program approved in 2004 will ensure the continuation of cattle ranching into the future. The Rural Land Stewardship Bill would allow us to enter into a contract with a developer. The developer, he wants a permit to build a new city. Uh, the county wants to preserve open space and trees and grass and wildlife and cattle and horses. As a trade-off, developers pay for development rights. The land is then appraised. Land with more natural environments and wildlife is considered more valuable. We're able to sell our development rights and that in effect strips much of the value out of our real estate, which it enables us to pass it on uh, through inheritance taxes to the next generation. The majority of Florida's ranchers are family-run businesses. As time goes by and families continue to grow, land and profits are spread increasingly thin. Selling off family land is becoming a common trend. Cattlemen have mixed emotions when it comes to selling their land. All of us people bought our lands and worked it like heck, and you know, and I think that that's the kind of the final reward is either to keep it in your family and pass it on to your children, or when the children don't want it anymore, you have the option to sell it. You know, I mean, that's just the God-given rights in the United States. Well, I won't sell mine. Uh, we're going to sell the home places, brother and I, but I won't sell this. This is in trust, and, and it's set aside, so uh, the kids and the grandkids and the great-grandkids are going to wind up with this, short of an emergency. Well, there's a lot of uh, debate going on even now, you know, among our tribe, you know, as to uh, cattlemen using up too much of land, you know, that they could use it for developing into some, maybe a more profitable uh, uh, enterprise. Jumper anticipates great change over the generation to come. Today, some of the leaders are, you know, are not really, grow, have grown up in a cattle atmosphere, so sometimes they, they don't uh, understand maybe the importance of that. This goes way back for us, not just the uh, alligator wrestling and canoes and you know, the sightseeing tours and all that. That's a part of our history, but, you know, we also have another part of our history that we must always hold on to. Raising cattle is also an important part of Florida's history and culture. The state remains one of the larger cattle producers in the nation. Beef cattle bring an estimated $371 million to Florida's economy per year. Currently, I believe we are number three east of the Mississippi and about number 15 in the United States as far as cow-calf production. But the future isn't certain. Short term, you would have to think they would decrease just because of how much growth of housing and, and different things in the state of Florida there are. Long term, there's always gonna be some land that, that won't be developed, whether it's set aside for a conservation easement or the state owns it and they just wanna lease it to, to maintain the vegetation. Hilliard foresees the industry managing despite the continued population growth. It's getting harder and harder to find places to raise hay and, and, and crop. Development's happening everywhere, not just in Florida, but in Texas, uh, Montana, all of the rangeland. Some envision a dark future if the nation's agricultural lands continue disappearing. What's going to happen is someday we're going to be like India and the people in, in over in Africa, we ain't going to have any food. There's going to be people, but no food. Who's going to raise all this beef? 
The continued survival of Florida's cattle industry depends on preserving land and attracting new generations of ranchers. Trade shows, conventions, and livestock fairs are effective ways of getting young people involved in the industry. Some think the attraction will continue naturally. People like this life. Those old folks, they have grandchildren, and, uh, and uh, if you expose boys to horses and cattle and guns and dogs, most of them like it. And uh, you give them a chance, they'll stay. And I see my baby play in the waters of old Tampa Bay. I thank the Lord that Florida is my home. It's easy to be proud when you're a cracker. In Florida, raising cattle isn't just about economics. It's about preserving a unique, vibrant culture, maintaining the agrarian way of life, as well as keeping family businesses and land intact. For generations, the state's cowmen, cowwomen, and ranchers have forged livelihoods and reputations based on resilience, ingenuity, and adaptability. They are living legends. To purchase a copy of this and other WGCU-produced programs, go to WGCU.org or call 1-888-824-0030. This program was produced for the citizens of Southwest Florida by WGCU Public Media. Show your appreciation for programs like these. Become a member of WGCU, a business supporter, or leave a legacy through a state or planned gift. Call or visit our website at WGCU.org.